Bertrand and Nonna, Tour of the Sabre Institute, and the Certified American Cross. <clears throat> I'm an ADM person, I didn't graduate there, but I'm very aware of all the damage that industrial agriculture is causing to A, the environment, and B, people. The good news is, there's a lot of people out there in North America, farmers who are managing regeneratively, regenerating soil health, ecological function, and farm profitability, and then how to cash flow it. Those are the people I do research with. So that we relate directly to the people who manage the land. Ninety percent of soil function and hence ecological function comes from the contribution of microbes, and the microbes depend almost totally on plants. So how we manage the plants is critical. The plants capture energy. driving the whole system, they provide carbohydrates to the bugs and the, and the fungi, and the fungi feed back nutrients and water that makes the whole thing work well. If we mess with that, we mess with the whole system. If we improve that, we improve the whole system. The biggest factor limiting range lands and most grazing lands is the amount of water we get in the ground, not the amount of rain we get. This was taken on two neighboring properties in, in northern Mexico um, on the same day. The difference on the right there, well managed, on the left, not managed. But getting water in the ground is not the total picture. As you've been told by many people today, we need to make sure we're capturing a maximum amount of energy and getting it into the biological system. The water cycle has to function extremely well. The mineral cycle has to work, and that doesn't just mean the cows eating the grass and pooping. That means the plant connection with the microbes and making that work really well. And you need the right community to make that function work. And each of these things is usually uh, part of the degradation process and we have to improve it. Let's look at the importance of microbes and fungi. First of all, they improve the soil structure. The macro and the micro aggregation that's required to get water in the ground is controlled mostly by healthy fungal activity. Fungi also improve the access and transport of nutrients to the plants. They occupy much more of the soil volume than the plant roots alone. So they help uh, aid, put exudates in the soil and they bring in moisture that would otherwise not be available uh, during droughts. We're also finding that about 80% of the microbes in the soil, including fungi, are beneficials. And they actually fend off a lot of the negatives of the non-beneficial uh, bugs. And there's quite a bit of research on that going on now. And there's other research that shows the very highest productivity of the ecosystem depends on a very high fungal to bacterial ratio. Equal partners in providing all the good things we, um, we enjoy from the land are earthworms, they're fundamental. If you've got healthy fungus and healthy earthworms, that is all the nutrition and soil structure that you need to make any crop grow. And another one of our great friends are dung beetles. It's quite easy to manage so that you decrease the fungi, the earthworms, and the dung beetles. We've just got to avoid doing the things that destroy them. So if you look at the normal way things are managed, this is a 3,000 acre here in the hill, uh, property here in the hill country, and the green dots are the GPS positions of cars through the year. You'll notice they concentrate in the areas they want to and they overutilize them. In the other areas they don't utilize. Is that a good or a bad thing? Let's look at it. Research doesn't get the picture because it operates at this sort of scale. 
which doesn't come close to telling what happens in a managed scenario. Really, uh, scientists who work at small scales like this, they are playing putt-putt golf, you guys are managing an 18-hole golf situation. So let's look at continuous grazing and its impact. On the left, my continuous grazing, you can see here taller grasses that are not lying sunlight to come in. Here you've got shorter grasses that like plenty of sunlight to come in, but they've been numbed off all the time. How deep do you think their roots are? It's not very deep at all. When you get a drought, what happens? That's what you crave, bare ground. And you don't recover from that. It's just a perpetual going backwards. What's the nutrient cycling there compared and, and here? Not very good. Um, and the, the species, the productive species that you want here have been diminished. They've been even more diminished when it reaches this stage of degradation. Now we know from all the people that we work with that you can change a fairly degraded situation like this with lots of bare ground and not many of the really desirable plants with poor water um, functioning ecosystem to one that is very, very productive and everything is working well. That's what we're going to be talking about. This is a normal sort of situation on most, most ranches where people would be running a herd in each one of these paddocks. And what we're talking about to develop regenerative grazing is subdividing it. Now, I know this is not the right pattern to be using, but it's just to illustrate the principles. So, a lot of people would put a single herd in each one of these and practice rotational grazing. That's not the same as regenerative grazing. But what people have found is that if they combine all the animals into one herd and move them as necessary within that system, one herd operating through that whole deal, it sounds more complicated, much easier to manage, the improvement to the resources, the economies, the profits, the animal performance is much better with a more developed regenerative system. What's an example of this? A very simple experiment done with regenerative grazing at the Nobel Foundation. You will notice here a couple of decent grasses, this pretty decent soil and tall grass prairie, but lots of ragweed and stuff in there. How many people would say, oh, you need to come in and spray with, with a weed aside there to get rid of the weeds or plant up and reseed it? No, what they did is say, it was in poor condition, they put 18 paddocks from one watering point, and they managed so that they didn't overuse, utilize the plants that they wanted and allow them to recover in between. Um, movements between the paddock. And these are the results that, that they obtained. Animal unit days of the length of the period, they started off down here, ended up there after not too many years. We're working with commercial ranches now up in our area, and there's a couple of them in this room, who made a similar improvement in the number of animals and productivity You'll notice a couple of dips. What are they due to? The old drought that comes along. If you manage adaptively, adapt your numbers and the period of growth, as Walt said, judging by the growth of the, of the plants, you will continue to move upward in the long term. So the basic principles that they used is flexible stocking, spread the grazing of a whole ranch, as soon as you've divided up to many paddocks, you can actually graze every portion of the ranch and you're not just grazing where the animals want to graze. Defoliate moderately in the growing season so the plants come back quickly. Use short grazing periods that's good for the animals and good for the, to the plants. And provide adequate recovery before regrazing. It's one of the most underestimated things when we first started. Now we're learning how to do this better in the dry areas and the, more, uh, and the wetter areas. And we've got a better handle on it now. <clears throat> and adaptively changing this, changing conditions, always watching the growth rate of the grass to make decisions, as well said. So let's look now at the, at the, the choices we have. Regenerative grazing, continuous grazing, and the light or heavy. 
energy flow. Best there by far. You've got a lot of green there, and because you graze them and come back and keep it green for longer during the, se uh, during the season, you're fixing energy for ma many more days in the year. This situation here, you've got a lot of these old dead plants that actually prevent energy from being captured. These plants aren't growing really well, and uh, they don't capture nearly as much energy as they could. And with the amount of bare ground got here, you got here, and the minimum amount of water getting in the ground, not much less um, <coughs> energy being fixed. Water cycle, very poor here, poor there, and much better there. The mineral cycling, both the above ground and the below ground, much, much better there than either of these two situations. And of course, the, the plant composition here is much, much better because you're not overgrazing continually all the desired plants, which is happening in both these circumstances. So in every one of the, the uh, ecosystem services that, that we need to be uh, concerned about, this is far superior. And what it translates to is, on the left-hand side, continuous grazing, the coloration, darker there means more carbon in the soil. After 10 years, the soil carbon changed from less than 1% to greater than 10%. The infiltration rate, less than an inch an hour, to over inches an hour, eight inches an hour. Do you think this produces a bit more? A lot of the academics will say to me, how can it produce more? You get the same sunlight, the same amount of rain. This is why. Because they're A, fixing more energy, and B, you're getting more moisture in the ground. That's why it's clearly ahead. And this is from Neil Dennis, one of the best exponents that we've got. We haven't reached such great results here in Texas, but there are good reasons for that. We have improved uh, made improvements there. So, I learned with ranchers and the, the consultants like Watt and Rancher for Profit and people like that. And qualitatively they have found the following things. It takes a minimum of 10 paddocks to stop overgrazing. Ranching with fewer is rotational overgrazing because they stay too long and they come back too soon. To support decent animal performance it takes at least 14 to 16. The most rapid range improvement takes over 30 paddocks or more. And as I said earlier, this is actually a lot easier to manage. And the biggest decrease in workload is to be with 50 paddocks. Makes life much simpler. So, <coughs> it is also the fastest and cheapest way to create more paddocks is by combining herds. Have one herd instead of three or four. And one herd reduces the workload a lot, as those of you know. And productivity per acre is improved without decreasing individual animal performance. And carrying capacity and total productivity are greatly increased at low cost. And long recovery periods are critical. This is what the ranchers have been finding right throughout the world with all the people we work with. And our research, both the research with the producers and the research with modeling uh, that I do, is that ecological function and profitability both increase with increasing number of paddocks, assuming that they're managed according to the rules we've been discussing. And short periods of grazing with adequate recovery give the greatest profits and ecological function. Adjusting grazing management to changing conditions increases ecological function and productivity. Fixed management protocols reduce benefits hugely. If you don't change according to the growth rate of your grass, which is governed by the weather, you do not get anything like the same results that you get if you are adaptive. So both our experiments and farm um, experience shows that. Profitability decreases if recovery is too short or if it's too long. You've got to get it right for your environment and the stage and the weather cycle that you're currently living in. And stocking rates can be increased without damaging ecological function. If you're managing well to grow more grass, you can carry more animals without being overstocked. Overstocking is when you don't have enough grass for the number of cattle you've got. 
It's not just a number per acre. And the, science, the most academics just don't get that. So, to improve crop and pasture soil health, crops and pastures, planted pastures, follow pretty much the same rules. You need to have diverse species and mixes. The more diverse the plant population, the more diverse and functional the microbes are on the soil. You need to incorporate perennial plants in the rotation because they give the maximum benefit. You need to grow plants for the maximum number of days of the year. You can change when you stop grazing and when you start again to increase the amount of green leaf you have through the year. And that's, that's one of the, the things you need to aim to do. <clears throat> you need to manage plants to make them more productive. Leave adequate plant residue so they grow quickly. Eliminate tillage completely. Minimize bare ground. Use organic amendments if you use them at all. And reduce in fertilizer use. And having said that, there are many people who don't believe that if you have the right fungi and the right earthworm population, that you don't need fertilizer. So they carry on wanting to put stuff on, but you don't need it. Because we have plenty of people right through North America and in other countries that have figured out that you don't need it. So we did some work um, spreading from the work we, we started in Texas, which is down here. We gained 1.7% carbon per year over 15 years. Three tons per acre per year we added compared to the neighbor who's just regular management. So we got some money a couple of years ago to go to Canada and move the plans and also across here. We have a gain of 2% per year and a gain of 1% per year up here. Now the Paris Accord, they want us to aim at that level, which people say is too high. But you look at this, this is four times higher than that. This is nearly three times higher than that. And this is five times higher than that. So we know people are currently putting more out than this supposedly over-optimistic goal. The reason why we get better results is this. When the bison and the wolves are in a place, this is what the carbon levels are like. With conventional grazing and cropping stuff, we drove it all the way down. Regenerative grazing that we've been following, we believe, has now actually raised it up that amount. And these are measured amounts, we've, we've got the, the, the data to show that. Most research scientists are working down here in a degraded situation. They don't believe you can get up there. But you know what the irony is? They wouldn't even come to the ranches that we've located that measured and know that it's there. They wouldn't even come and look at them. It's a fine mindset, isn't it? This is where they need to be working. And what we're doing is we're measuring here what is the function under this grazing compared to that grazing and cropping. And that's why we're getting better results than that. The other thing you need to know is scientists, scientific work, the vast majority, they've measured soil carbon down to 12 inches in depth. But these plants go down six, eight feet. We measured down in our Texas study one and a, um, six feet. There's a hang of a lot more carbon all the way through six feet than there is just in one foot. And that's one of the reasons why we get better results in that, is because we're measuring more of the whole environment. Now, under continuous grazing, you have a great effect on the watershed of a, of a ranch or an area. Dirty water, lots of runoff, regenerative grazing, clean water, and uh, Reduced. Uh, we've done an experiment. This is this is a Denton. We've been measuring for over 100 years. The amount of runoff through this catchment, which starts up near Wichita Falls, uh, <clears throat> we've been measuring the amount of runoff there, and also the quality, the amount of uh, nitrogen and phosphate that comes out. So we've got a data set, and. In this watershed, most of it, the dark green, is native rangeland. The yellow is wheat that's grazed, and these areas here are the, uh, the oak, uh, oak, oak patch. So we ran this through the, 
the, uh, the model uh, that the USDA uses for hydrological function. And when we ran it using heavy continuous grazing, which it was, <clears throat> the surface runoff is considerably more than the water that gets to the ground. Light continuous grazing, there's no significant difference between them. But when you go to, to manage grazing, significantly more gets in the ground than runs off. And this is an area, exposure, it hasn't been grazed for about 20 years. So this is pretty good. But what are the other functions? Remember there are four ecological functions. is capture of sunlight. If you just leave an area, how much light are you capturing? You get lots of tall grass, little loose stem tall grass, and, and, tall, and nothing else. And it's all dead, and that doesn't allow much energy capture at all. Plus, your nutrient cycling has gone to hell. And there's only two species there, the taller growing grasses. So your biodiversity is shot completely. So although this looks good from a watershed point of view, all the other, the other three um, ecological factors are extremely important. Now, everybody will tell you cows are bad so because they create emissions, um, so we need to get rid of them, really. So this is work done by the ARS. Under light continuous grazing, this is the emissions from the cows, and this is the amount of, of uh, carbon sequestered. This is a strong negative carbon footprint. These guys are doing good, and they're looking after the watershed too. Even under heavy continuous grazing, there was more being sequestered than emitted. In our Texas study, we calculated the emissions. These are the emissions when you change from heavy continuous to light continuous. You see there's a huge increase in, in um, Sequestered versus emissions. Heavy continuous to amp grazing, there's more emissions, but there's also a hang of a lot more sequestration taking place with managed grazing. So we're ahead of the curve there. As long as they're grazing only. As soon as you move them across to the feedlot, they now inherit the strong carbon footprint of corn and all the gunk that's produced in the feedlot. So that's where they're a problem when they're grazing. They are not a problem, they are part of the solution. Now, a friend of mine working up in Michigan, um, Jason Roundtree, he's done some of the studies to what we did in a low put system that we just on range, normally managed, and this one is where they've got legumes and things like that. The break even on emissions is one ton carbon per hectare per year. For the higher things, you need to get better than two tons of carbon per year. But both of those systems are adding plus or minus four tons of carbon per hectare per year. So both of these systems are net carbon sinks. No problem there. Part of the solution. Right. One of the other big things about moving and getting better at soil health is nutrient density. And this has been around, figures we, we've known these from 40s up to 2000. With vegetables, fruit, meat and dairy, these are the nutrients and just about everything has decreased in that time period because of industrial agriculture. This is work that's currently being done up in Canada the effect on omega-3s of feeding in the feedlot. The, the quality of the meat was up here, percent of total fat, omega-3s, and the longer they stayed in here, the lower and lower it got. This is Colin Sice's information from New South Wales using uh, pasture cropping and uh, improved grazing and you'll see that he managed to increase every one of these factors by increasing the health of the soil. I may ask, what's the pertinence of this? Well, if you challenge nutritionists or, pharma or doctors or anybody with this data, they'll say, well, you just take a supplement. That's not the point. 
A, we don't know if the supplement is actually biologically as good for you as when it comes from this source. Plus, what we really want is land that's managed in a regenerative way, as well as food that is better for you with high nutrient density. You need both of those things together. So that's why it's so important for everything. Now let's look at some of the, uh, the work from uh, Gabe Brown, um, who's used no fertilizer since 2007. He compared organic with no tool, low diversity of plants, no tool <clears throat> with a high, um, high synthetic fertilizers, and then the no tool with high density stocking and livestock, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and water extractable organic carbon. This is way ahead of any of the others. Much better soil health, much better um, nutrient density and food health coming from that particular system. So, we know that regenerative holistic grazing can build soil carbon and microbial function. It enhances water infiltration and retention, builds soil fertility, controls erosion more effectively, enhances watershed hydrological function, improves livestock production and economic terms while improving the resource base, and improves the nutrient content of grass-fed product, enhances wildlife diversity, and results in soils being a stronger net greenhouse gas sink. That is all I have to say. I'd like to say one thing that gives me great encouragement going into the future is a number of young farmers starting off applying regenerative agricultural principles and the number of educated younger consumers who know what quality food is and demand it and both of those things give me great confidence going forward. Thank you. Um, who's got the who's got the email list for you? You've got it on your machine. I don't mind you sending it to everybody. Yeah, we I've actually had more than one person ask if that would be okay. Yeah. You might have to send it as a PDF, for those would be too big. Yes, sir. I got a question about um, planting. Uh, I saw some research uh, showing that you can plant people. Where they're doing some inoculation, we call it bug and adjust. Uh, the uh, the uh, fungi, uh, you know, in a, in a jug. Have you have you had any experience with that? I worked with Betsy Ross a little bit, um, but because of lack of funding, we had to do it in a small scale, small plots and just little plots. We didn't get anything. The only thing we got was when we sterilized the soil that we collected from the field and added the tea to it, it behaved like a soil that was not sterilized. But we couldn't get any additive effect. But having said that, what we know about fungi is that they, a single colony of fungi will cover, have hyphae that cover multiple acres. So we, I don't believe that they function properly when they're in a small little plot like that. You have to study them in the field, which is one of the reasons we work with farmers. We measure it in the field where things have been managed differently for a number of years. And that's the only way you're really going to find out what's the difference there. So I can't answer your question. Um, what we'd have to do is go back to the places where they've tried it and do some measurements where they haven't versus where they have. In a functional system, not just a little plot. It doesn't work that way. Yes, sir. If we're managing a conventional type operation, you know, moving forward into to do that, but it would be a good for your peace of mind and your record keeping to actually know where you stole it all from, because you will probably find that, I don't know if this is previously plowed ground, ground or if it's never been plowed. Yeah, what, what you're going to find is your organic matter is probably less than 
on the Dixon Water Foundation when they'd been going for four years with planned grazing. Um, they moved from 1% to 4% in about four years of organic matter. And that's, that is because they managed, they didn't put uh, inorganic fertilizers on, they didn't put any pesticides on at all, they just managed according to the growth of the grass and kept it, kept it green and leafy, which we know improves organic matter. So it would be good to, as a base to start off with. But Walter's a guy who's done this a lot of times. If you apply the principles, these things will jump ahead. But you're quite right in wanting to start off at point zero, time zero, and to measure it sometime in the future to understand what progress have you made. That's a very good uh, management principle. I want to be in the a farm that was plowed, planted, ground up year after year for many years, and you've had it for just like 40 years now. What about the same kind of question that from my community? Because what, what does that not mean? Do you just have to say what do you need to add to it to get it to help? What you need to do is monitor to find where you are now. Now, uh, Pam, Pam, are you here? At lunchtime, we, I had a good discussion with her. We asked, I've, I've been here before, and we've never seen dung beetles in that round. But she said, outside the fence, in the road verge there, there are dung beetles signed all over the place, even without cattle being there, so that there's no. And she asked her boss, who had never told her that they'd round up this place, and he had to admit that they'd round up it. So there is a residual effect that affects something like that. We don't understand how or why or how to get beyond that. But taking that sort of measurement and doing a, a, a full bacterial and fungal count uh, now as part of your record and, and monitoring system, that would be a good place to start. Carry on doing the principles. Um, what is the current um, plant species that occurs in the area? Yes. They were dead. Yeah. What came back first was Johnson grass. Yeah. Some flowers, 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 some Managing for the plants that they wanted. Don't overutilize them, allow them to recover. And within three, four years, even in the 16 inch rainfall areas, all the right plants came back to dominate. Nothing else needed except management. It works. Well, what we're feeling around with a little bit now, and I say feeling around with because the precursor to doing research is to try different things and see what works. Then you start doing experiments on that. What we're doing a little bit now is to use cover crops in, in, a, in summer grain grasses like you're talking about now. Is to in fall, you put in a mix of cover crops that grow through the winter and you allow them to carry on growing in uh, into the, the beginning of the summer grain grasses in spring because that'll prevent the, all these problem plants from coming up and then pulse graze it graze at the right amount and get off and let it recover. That might, that will jump forward your organic matter very quickly. Doing it the previous way I told you about, just using natural processes will take much longer. Putting a cover crop in there, we know jumps the uh, organic matter up. And we know with all these native grasses, if you want the high cereal grasses, the, the, the big blue stem, the little blue stem, um, the, uh, the native panicum and stuff like that, they need a threshold amount of carbon. You have to be above two, approaching 3% carbon. So if your current status is less than 1%, you need to build that up quickly, and then you can expect those plants to come in. Coming back to the Dixon Foundation, they did that, and they started introducing plants, and nothing would take, nothing would take. Suddenly, with the last two good seasons in a row that we had, all the plants that they put on there have just gangbusters come through, and in one season, it just jumped forward four serial stages. So the processes were all taking place, but it had to go, get above a threshold in the soil before all the right things came together. Now they're sitting pretty at 6x productivity of what they had before. The Dixon Foundation? Dixon Water Foundation. They have properties in Marfa and also near Munster. Uh, one dry land, the other 
dry country, the other one um, fairly moist, and which they're doing this kind of research. Very good organization to connect with. Thank you, sir. Thank you.